Yep, got it. Thank you. Say that again, I'm sorry. I think I am. There we go. Follow host view. I'm sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, excuse me. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for being here this evening. My name is Tom Bonner. I'm the recovery officer for Montgomery County. We are excited to be here this evening and speak to you about the upcoming opportunity for pandemic recovery funds. I'd first like to start the meeting with our uh, county commissioner, chair of the county commissioner board, um, Dr. Val R. Cush. Dr. R. Cush. Thanks, Tom. Well, good evening, everybody. I want to welcome everyone to tonight's town hall. The American Rescue Plan Act, known by its initials ARPA, will allocate $161 million to Montgomery County over the next several years. We intend for these pandemic recovery funds to have a transformational impact on our county which is why we continue to gather input from all of our stakeholders to ensure we use this funding thoughtfully and for maximum impact. We're so glad that you could join us this evening for one of three hybrid events scheduled for this week to discuss how you can submit ideas or projects for consideration. By listening to you, our residents and community partners, by researching best practices and leveraging other resources, we will create impactful initiatives, investments and infrastructure improvements that will have long-term measurable and sustainable impact across Montgomery County. Tonight, you're gonna to hear from representatives from the Montgomery County Recovery Office who will share information on what ARPA funds can be used for and how to submit an idea or project for consideration. They will review the process and touch on important upcoming deadlines. So thank you all again for being here this evening. We look forward to your submissions and to the impact that you will make on our communities. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Arkush. At this time, I'd like we're joined by Deputy Chief Operating Officer Barbara O'Malley, who also will say a few words to introduce the evening. Good evening, everyone. Again, and welcome. I'm Barbara Malley, the Deputy Chief Operating Officer for Montgomery County. And we are glad to have such a large and diverse group of individuals participating with us tonight on the town hall. We are continuing our commitment to an open, transparent, and equitable process for the distribution of American Rescue Plan Act funding. Since our last town hall, our recovery team have been hard at work to understand the regulations of ARPA, developing the submission process, incorporating your feedback and ideas, developing an objective scoring system, and identifying resources to assist residents and organizations to submit thoughtful, impactful ARPA project applications. Well, we have created this process to be as simple as possible with lots of supporting documentation and frequently asked questions. We know that there may be entities unfamiliar with the project submission process. To ensure that we hear from as many residents and partners as possible, the county is contracted with an outside partner to provide technical assistance to entities who may have barriers to the application process, such as language, technology, or just any questions whatsoever. In addition, when the process begins, 
we will have a resource area available with local data to support and inform your projects, as well as suggested ideas from county residents and actual plans for ARPA funding from other local and national sources. The county is also working with some partners and are hopeful to offer incubation meetings for anyone to participate to explore ideas and partnerships for this funding. We will also continue our outreach and awareness regarding this opportunity through our county communications office and also in partnership with Here For Us. Our goal is to ensure equitable opportunity and voice for the use of this funding. Your participation and feedback has been critical and we are pleased to share with you tonight the submission process and look forward to seeing your ideas and projects and helping work together to build back better. Thank you for coming this evening and we most look forward to this process beginning. Thank you, Ms. O'Malley. I appreciate, as I said, everyone being here this evening. I am going to share a screen for a presentation. As Ms. Co Francisco, Director of our Communications Office, indicated, if you do have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. We, at the end of our presentation, we will be allowing ample time for questions and answers. We look forward to hearing from all of you. I am joined this evening by several members of the recovery office team. You will be meeting some of them as we go through the evening um, and people may be jumping in to answer questions. Again, I will get started by sharing this screen. Okay. As Dr. Arkush and Ms. O'Malley indicated, we are excited this evening to begin the process of accepting submissions of projects and ideas to be considered by Montgomery County for the pandemic recovery funds. This evening, we will go through background information as far as what has presented this transformative opportunity and how to participate most productively in this process. I stress at the beginning, and as you will hear me do throughout this presentation, we are excited to get your ideas, to understand what is out there that needs attention, that what can, what can be mitigated throughout Montgomery County and our surrounding community, and how best to represent the citizens that we represent. The American Rescue Plan Act, which funds this entire initiative, was signed into law on March 11th, 2021, which allocated $1.9 trillion across multiple programs nationwide. ARPA is divided into several allocations, many of which you've heard in other capacities. School districts have received, for instance, ESSERS Fund, Emergency Rental Assistance Fund. Tonight, and for the purposes of the Pandemic Recovery Funds process, Montgomery County is focused on the allocation provided by the state and local fiscal recovery funds. Under ARPA, SLFRF, as we abbreviate it, was allocated $350 billion nationwide. Of this, the state of Pennsylvania received seven, excuse me, $7.3 billion in their allocation. That is completely separate from Montgomery County's allocation of $161.4 million, which we are referring to as the pandemic recovery funds and which tonight's presentation and the efforts of our office over the next several months will focus. What can be submitted through our process? As it says here, the county needs to understand from you what is important, what you have already been working on, and what may only be conceptual, but has potential. Submissions fall into two main categories, projects and ideas. A project is a fully developed program, service, or initiative for the county to fund. Submission process for a project requires justification, financial and operational plans, and an explanation of the management of the project you're proposing. Our staff in the recovery office will analyze and vet project submissions as our process proceeds. We will score submissions using an assessment rubric published on our website, which we'll speak about later this evening. And the approved projects from the submission process will be adopted into the recovery plan. You'll hear me use the words recovery plan. Recovery plan simply means 
the list of all of the projects approved for funding under the county's pandemic recovery fund allocation. Again, we are welcoming both projects and ideas through our process. An idea communicates to the county a suggested focus for the expenditure of pandemic recovery funds as a priority or as a conceptual plan. Minimal information is required. This is not a funding request, and we will review and may refer to relevant partners. To be clear, an idea can be anything from, I would like to see the county focus on, for instance, affordable housing. I would like to see the county focus on premium pay. A project is a suggest is a proposal for a detailed scope that follows our funding rules and our eligibility concerns. Ideas can be submitted through the Recovery Office website beginning Monday, February 28th, 2022, as can be projects. I focus on the idea side here because the portal is the same. You will hear focus for the rest of this presentation on the submission of projects, but ideas are submitted the same way through the, prod, through the website and require minimal information to get started. Who can submit? Truthfully, the answer is anyone. Nonprofit organizations, community groups, individuals, school districts, municipal governments, municipal and county governments, excuse me, fiscal sponsors, faith groups, for profit businesses are all encouraged to submit. I say that because we are interested in getting ideas from everyone, whether you are an individual that has no capacity to manage the entire project yourself, but we want to hear that idea and see if we can do it. Any entity submitting a project that requests funding to manage, meaning as a subrecipient, will have to answer capability questions and we will assess those. So to be sure, we are going to make sure that your capacity to manage whatever project that you're suggesting you can is valid and that we have confidence that you are starting off with an implementable program, that you have a project that can happen within the funding timeframe. At this time, I'm going to turn it to Emma Hurt, Strategy Director here at the Montgomery County Recovery Office. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'll spend the next couple of minutes talking about projects that have uh, the highest likelihood of being funded. Um, and we'll talk through both our local priorities for projects, as well as uh, eligibility for projects that can be funded under the Pandemic Recovery Fund. Uh, so the first, we'll speak to the priorities for county funding. As both uh, Barbara and the commissioner mentioned earlier, we've been engaging over the last few months in a series of opportunities to allow community residents to uh, let their priorities be heard around how this funding should be used. And we have done that through town halls, through surveys, uh, through assessment of local data, and through an understanding of how other partners throughout the country are spending their recovery funds. And through all that process, we've been able to identify first five community priorities touching on specific issue areas that are of particular relevance to Montgomery County residents. <clears throat> the first is affordable housing. Uh, the second, mental health and behavioral health care services. Child care, public health emergency response, or digital access. You'll note that these are fairly broad categories, and we are um, providing more detailed information around what this could look like on our website uh, coming next week. Second, we have priorities around how projects are structured or how to um, uh, really structure projects so that we can have the most long-term and transformative impact possible. And so here, what we're looking for first is that projects uh, will receive a higher priority if they are targeted and informed by historically underserved communities across Montgomery County. Second is that the project provides a direct response to an impact of the pandemic or to an issue that has been made more severe by the, by the pandemic itself. And then finally, we're looking for projects that have the potential for a long-term transformative impact. And I think here, this is probably where there's the most confusion just because this can be a vague concept. And so what we had attempted to do is provide a more clear definition around what this could look like for your project proposal. Uh, when we think of projects with long-term transformative impact or opportunity for transformative change, we're thinking about projects that address root causes or systemic barriers to achieving economic opportunity or overall well-being. Um, and really with the impact that's occurring, not at an individual or a household level, 
but rather at the neighborhood community or broader levels, such as the school district level, uh, municipality level, or at the, at the county level at, as a whole. Um, examples of what this could look like in terms of a project proposal itself um, is that the project may be looking at changing discriminatory or inequitable policies or practices. It might be looking at addressing a historic lack of investment in certain communities in Montgomery County or lack of access to services or goods. Again, we're providing more information on all of these definitions on our website with that information going up early next week. These priorities will all be addressed in the scoring as well as the eligibility for projects as well. Um, so here, in addition to the priorities, uh, a project needs to be eligible to be funded under the pandemic recovery funds. And eligibility here is really defined at the federal level. Um, there are five main categories for eligibility uh, under which projects may, may qualify. The first is that a project responds to the public health emergency. This might be something like funding for COVID-19 mitigation efforts, for medical expenses, uh, for vaccination programs or testing or contact tracing, uh, for enhancing public health data programs or the like. Second is that projects could respond to negative economic impacts caused by the public health crisis. This might be things such as aid to families uh, and workers for food or housing or other financial insecurity, uh, supports for small businesses through grants and loans and counseling programs. Uh, it might be addressing industries that have been overtly impacted by the pandemic, such as tourism, travel, and hospitality sectors. Third is that projects could be designed to replace lost public sector revenue. Uh, fourth is that projects could be designed to provide premium pay for essential workers, such as offering additional support to those who have and will be at the greatest health risk during the pandemic um, to provide their services. And then the final category is investing in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure, um, or expanding access to broadband internet. So again, these categories will be reflected uh, throughout the application, and you'll have the opportunity to demonstrate how your project meets these eligibility criteria and how your project meets the priorities that have been identified at the local level. And our assessment rubric when scoring will also take these into account. Tom? Oh, um, one more note uh, is that uh, on eligibility, this applies to all projects, is that all costs must be incurred between March 3rd, 2021, and must uh, and through December 31st of 2026. All projects must be completed within that time frame. So projects must, must have a, a planned completion date by the 31st of December of 2026. Um, and then finally, just to note that this is one-time funding and we will be looking for projects to provide either an explanation of how uh, funding for the project or service will be continued using non-pandemic recovery funds after the end of this project period or you know, asking for more information around if the project intends to just be completed by that time, such as if it's the construction project. Thank you, Emma. How do you submit projects along these, time, uh, along these guidelines that we've just gone through? Tonight, we are describing the project submission process. As it says here, the county portal for these submissions opens on Monday, February 28th, 2022. High level, these five steps is the process for submitting our projects, for submitting your projects and your ideas. First step is obviously to prepare. As Emma mentioned, we will be posting instruction documents, FAQs, guidance documentation, and contact information for a technical assistance provider on our website. Anyone interested in submitting should be looking at that information. We will be funding projects in, that score highly along the lines of those priorities that are, that are eligible projects that represent fulfillment of this transformative opportunity throughout Montgomery County. After that preparation is over, starting as early as February 28th and ending as late as maybe not, not waiting until 11.59 p.m. on the 30th of April, 2022, but anytime up to that point, I do wanna be clear there is no awards or rolling basis consideration that will occur during this period. We are allowing this time period to take in all submissions. We will be scoring them and then posting scores after the submission period is over. 
technical assistance, which I will talk in more detail about and which Ms. O'Malley mentioned at the beginning, is available for anyone who needs assistance with this process. The intent of the county's contract with our technical assistance provider is to directly and emphatically remove barriers to submissions. And as we'll talk about in a few minutes, that is what they are there to do. And contact information will be available on our county's website in advance of your submission through our portal. Our team in the recovery office will review these submissions, make contact with people who did the submitting as needed. We will evaluate projects for basic eligibility. Did you fulfill the intent of the funding? Is this project eligible under the funding rules? We score projects and we will post on the county website all projects and their scores after April 30th. I do want to emphasize that the entirety of this process will be posted and communicated to the general public through our website and across the community because we are interested in ensuring that this process and our, and our work around the pandemic recovery funds follows both an equitable but also transparent and objective process. We will publish the draft recovery plan. As I mentioned earlier, the recovery plan is the list of all projects approved by the county for funding based on what we take in during the submission process. We will be circulating that draft recovery plan in the community for feedback, which will then lead to a final recovery plan. We will be contacting project submitters for funding agreements as makes sense. So for instance, if you are suggesting, if you are submitted a project and said that you are going to fund the project and you are gonna manage the contracts and manage the work, you will become a subrecipient of this funding and our grant agreement with you will reflect that responsibility. You also, we may receive, we plan to receive projects that don't require subrecipient relationship. They may require simply a partnership with the county and the county can and maintain management of the project and build this implementation of implementable program. As it says here, the final step is that we adopt the final recovery plan at the county level and we begin the project implementation phase. So obviously, while this is incredibly exciting, what we're doing right now is merely the beginning of the work to do to fulfill the intent of the funding that was provided to us. We are here with this funding to contribute to the recovery of Montgomery County. And that project implementation period is the part where excitingly we get to do that. Technical assistance is available to anyone, as I said, interested in submitting a proposal. We are seeking to eliminate obstacles. Services are accessible in multiple languages. As you see here, the technical assistant provider is contracted to the county to provide general support and technical help, pre-submission review of proposals, training and assistance on how to craft a clear effective proposal, assistance with finding supporting data, support in multiple languages, including two applicants in Spanish, Korean, and Mandarin Chinese, and support to applicants with disabilities or impairments. Contact information through phone, email, text, and direct support will all be available on our website. And we encourage people who have either never done this before or are curious or, or simply need help finding additional data to justify their scope to approach our technical assistance provider. That is what they're there for. Again, how do I submit a project? What you see on the right side of your screen is a, screen, is a screenshot of our submission portal. The entire form is web-based. We will be collecting the data in real time. We will be able to analyze data much quickly rather than using paper forms. At the same time, we will make available a Word copy of this entire submission form so that people can work through it before going into the portal. The portal does allow saving, it does allow drafts. There isn't a rush once you start that you have to finish in a certain amount of time. All project submissions require a budget, a schedule, a performance metric plan. To be clear, what that means is that as we ask for the effect of your project, who does your project benefit and how does it benefit, we will ask for metrics that will be used to report on those performance measures as the project progresses. Your plan and your project needs to include uh, reflection of that. Obviously, a description of the project and the management structure. To pause here for a second, the flexibility of this funding affords the county the ability to manage these projects in multiple ways. We can have 
a subrecipient relationship where a third party, a nonprofit provider, a community organization, a for profit business receives direct funding and is responsible for managing the project that they propose. That's one option. Another option is that someone submits an idea that they would like help with, that the county can do. We can use our infrastructure to manage a project directly with a partner guided by the person who submitted the idea or by the entity who submitted the idea. But at the end of the day, it would be the county managing that project. That's the second option. And then the third is something in between where we're maybe providing some funding to execute a project, but also to manage some of it in-house. This management structure is, re is directly requested through our application portal, and it will be part of any successful project submission. And lastly, and of course, we are looking to receive justification and supporting data. Why do we have to do this project? Every submission will be, every project submission will be assessed according to the same rubric. You're seeing in the background of this slide, just a quick example of what we will be using as far as criteria goes. The assessment criteria are listed here. The entire rubric will be available and published on the website so everyone can be considering that as you're preparing your proposals. And the criteria that are listed here and the weights that will be applied to them as far as scoring goes were directly informed by community feedback, feedback excuse me, that the county gained over months of engagement that we've conducted to date. As you can see here, the assessment criteria, and we've heard some of us touch on this already, community need, response to the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, budget eligibility, operational sustainability, and then as Ms. Hertz mentioned, project led by an engaging, impacted or underserved communities. After projects are approved as part of the recovery plan, anyone who will be a subrecipient will be responsible for compliance with the county's reporting schedule. We are obviously required, and I'm sure many of you understand this, under federal grant management rules to report every quarter. We will coordinate all reporting in compliance with US Treasury rules. The quarterly reports will go for the duration of the period of performance, which goes, as we said, till the end of December 2026. We will coordinate reporting both in-house within the county and with our colleagues and with external project leads across whether they're nonprofit or contract partners. To be clear, if performance targets are not met, the recovery office will work to help manage that. So if something stands in the way of the project, if there's delay, if there's some issue standing in the way, we will be a resource to help make it work. Our job, and as part of our mission, is to make sure that we build an implementable program of projects that can be executed using this funding. If the performance and or there's any other issues with the project, we are required to redirect and or recoup funding that may be provided. We will not end this period of performance without having spent to fulfill our mission of contributing to the recovery of Montgomery County. From here, and uh, you heard Ms. O'Malley and Dr. R. Kush mentioned, we have two other town halls this week. We will be conducting future town halls throughout the month of March um, to again, generate and keep the awareness going. Our updated recovery website will go live by this Friday. Our town hall presentations focus on this submission process, as I mentioned, will continue through mid-March, through March, excuse me. And our submission process, as I mentioned, but please take note, will open on Monday, February 28th, and will be open until the end of April. Excuse me. That's what I have. We are very happy to engage um, for any Q&A, as it says here, in-person attendees. For those of you on Zoom, we have approximately 10 people here in the room with us tonight. We're happy to have them. Um, they, people can start in the room by just coming to the podium to ask your question. Zoom attendees can type your question in the Q&A box, and Zoom attendees can also use the raise your hand feature and ask to be unmuted. With that, I will open this up to the room. I'm happy to entertain questions, and I know it's a little awkward, but you can come up to the podium and ask questions. So we're seeing you on camera, that's all. Come on up. I got more of a, a uh, concern. Uh, well, here, I'm gonna have you come up here. So let me just adjust this. This is magic. Magic. <laughs> For an old guy, you know. <laughs> all right, 
just making sure we're doing this right here. Okay. So then we click view. Okay. You can go ahead. Thank you. Um, I guess it's just like a regular meeting, Leroy James Waters III. Um, I live uh, in the village of Port Indian uh, on the Schuylkill River, and we've suffered two really bad floods in the past two years. This last one was a record. So naturally my concern is flood control, but actually the flood control is more important on the Stony Creek mainly because of uh, damage to bridges, roads flooded, so you can't get to the hospital. Uh, a number one reason for this is uh, uncontrolled stormwater. Now the, the damage to Whitehall Road Bridge, actually also at the same time, uh, Trooper Road was damaged. So we had three roads that were unaccessible to the, the uh, to the hospital and then there was Sturger Street in Norristown and uh, we all know that two years in a row uh, the parks and recreation facility and the zoo were damaged. Um, I think that the plan that was put together back in 1992 would work well with flood control in the farm park. The Norristown uh, Farm Park Master Plan which I've been studying provides for, uh, I think it was 17.8 acres of ponds, which I look at is flood control, uh, best management practices. Now, if we eliminate that much stormwater going into the Schuylkill River, in turn, it could um, minimize the height of the crest that in turn damaged the Norristown sewer plant. Um, there are several other things that I believe should be brought into attention. And I happen to have been studying the Schuylkill River for 50 years. Um, the first devastating damage to the Schuylkill River had to do with the coal industries dumping all their silt in it. Therefore, we lost the commerce of the watershed, the navigation, and uh, one could argue Philadelphia ended up uh, not in good shape after it lost the number one seaport. Um, I have a study here. This is a study of studies. And I've actually produced a uh, booklet that I don't know whether I should leave here or not. This is, this is a lot of the, the data and the information from all the previous studies all the way back to 1967 and also has some issues in here that had to do with what needs to be corrected to stop the damage to the Whitehall Road Bridge. And thank you so much. How did I do with my time? You did great actually. And I All just right, wanted cool. to say, I think well, honestly local. what you brought up um, does cross over obviously since the ARPA funding was passed, we had Hurricane Ida that caused extensive damage. So the projects you are speaking of or you're alluding to anyway, I think we certainly would be interested in, in seeing something come through for that. All right, good. Because I have more documentation here, observation, sure. et cetera, et cetera, that need to be shared, not only to reduce my frustration as being a flood victim, mm -hmm. but also to help my neighbors. Because nothing be encouraging more than having flood control on the Perky Omen we appreciate it. with Green Lane and protect everybody on the, down that way. So thank you. Those, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Appreciate the time. No problem. Anyone else in the room tonight? Sure. Come on up. Hi, my name is Pauline Braccio. Um, I live in Talmanson Township. I just heard about this this afternoon, but uh, one thought that came to me, well, a couple of them, but one of them is the streets uh, coming up Swede Street. I, even though I live in Talmanson Township, I come up to Norristown and there's plenty of roads in Talmanson Township that are really um, need, in need of repair. I know that the county gets money from the $5 extra fee on the registration of cars, 
but I still don't see any, the only thing that's really going on that I am aware of personally is the 202 project, the Route 202 project. But there are so many streets, whether they're owned by municipalities or the county, if the county has this money to share, there are plenty of roads that really need help. Um, another thing is I have been going to the school board meetings and one of the things that's really concerning to me is potential and actual child abuse by teachers to students. And one of my ideas for that is to put a camera in every single school room. This, and, and of course they, the teachers would know about it. And uh, I think it would also help for people to monitor and see how well the teachers are actually teaching the students, what they're teaching the students. I, there's a lot of um, speculation about certain kinds of uh, curriculum. And I just think that if people could actually see what is going on in the classrooms as far as the teacher teaching, uh, how the children are treated, how the children are behaving themselves, I think it would really help the school district, every school district. I'm not talking about just the one in which I live, which is North Penn. Another idea is perhaps uh, funding the police. I know that DA Steele was here on December 2nd and he's asking for more money for his budget. And um, I think it should be given to him. And part of that should go to training police officers. Uh, we know all about the city and how it's so bad, but out in the suburbs, there's still um, big issues. And um, I think having better communication between um, law enforcement and residents is a really huge thing to have. So please, um, you know, fund that, you know, there's, there should be no such thing as defunding the police. Okay. Everybody relies on them. Everybody does. Even those who are, even those who want to defund the police still call the police when they need to. So I think that they should be funded uh, better. Uh, those are, those are just some of the ideas that I had, and I hope that you take them seriously. Uh, most importantly is the, well, they're actually all three of them are equally important but I do um, worry about the children because from when my daughter was in school, and I'm talking 22 years ago, I saw children being abused, uh, special needs children who were not verbal. And that has stuck with me obviously for the past 22 years. And I'm hearing about it again and from other parents who have their children in school now. And I really think if those teachers know they're being observed, then they could curb their tendencies um, to abuse these children. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a couple questions coming in on Zoom, but I'll, I'll pause that. I'll, I'll answer a couple of them live, but I wanted to certainly anyone else in the room that wanted to make a comment or ask a question, we're certainly available. You also can change your mind and come up later. Um, I did want to, I'm just going through the Zoom Q&A right now. Um, I'm going to read some of this because I do think this is an important aspect of the work that we are doing. Um, the pandemic had wide ranging impacts on our lives, including generally making normal life more difficult. Given the broad impacts and generalized stress of the pandemic, how laser focused on the pandemic do submissions need to be? General quality of life makes unpredictable stresses such as the pandemic so other disasters more bearable. Straightforwardly, pandemic themed proposals might not be the ones that help the community the most. Thank you. I appreciate this question. I think, and I do want to stress this, though rules, the priorities that you saw here in the presentation, and again, we'll be sharing this with everyone, um, the eligibility rules as defined by the, in the legislation itself, are purposefully general and, are, and, and seek to do what is implied in this question, which is to apply the sense of recovery in as broad a brush as possible. We have a responsibility to make sure we stay within the eligibility, but as this um, question indicates, there is not a sense that it has to be, quote, related to whatever you might conceive of as the most specific aspects of the pandemic. It certainly could be, but it also could be what communities were adversely affected during the pandemic, but because of other exacerbating factors that have historically been an issue, whether there was a pandemic or not. There was, pin, there was recovery efforts that aren't directly related 
to the pandemic that would affect our recovery in general. And so one of the pieces that I wanna stress, and I, I think this is the punchline for all of this funding, we are afforded the opportunity to flexibly do many different things within the context of both the county priorities and the eligibility rules. And we hope, and we are doing these town halls and have done months of community engagement to engender the type of interest in those transformative projects, whether they're specifically related to pandemic and public health, which are all important, when, whether they're related to childcare, all of those are important projects. I can keep going on the list, unless you have. Um, sure. Okay, okay, so I'll make this quick. Um, there's a question, does the applicant need to be physically located in Montgomery County to apply? They do not need to be. We are placing a focus on those projects that affect people who live and work in Montgomery County. We are at the same time interested in the opportunity afforded by this funding because we and our surrounding counties and municipalities within our county and school districts within our county, we are in, all received funding through some vehicle of ARPA. We are interested in making sure we're facilitating coordination across jurisdictions. And so while our priority and our scoring will reflect a focus on Montgomery County residents and people who work here, we also will take care in the recovery office to work across jurisdictions if that's beneficial. Um, I will, there's a question about how the uh, awards will be evaluated. So projects that come in will be awarded, will be scored according to the assessment rubrics, which will be published on our website. There's some examples in this, um, question as far as scope slash magnitude of project, perceived slash represented priority community, size or scalability of the funding request, and lastly, the experience of underfunding for number of municipalities. Municipalities are specifically in a category where we are looking at as a partnership opportunity. We want to be sure that we augment work that's being done through funding that's received by municipalities, that we participate in, in coordinated projects that make sense for the benefit of maybe out across municipal, municipal boundaries. The evaluation criteria that are mentioned here are certainly included in our rubric. We want to be sure that we are um, funding, as we've spoken tonight about transformative, representative, and well thought out projects, efficiently planned, making sure that they're implemented and so what you have here, as far as the list here, certainly are incorporated into our decision-making. Um, the, there's a question here about, are you repeating this program? Effectively, yes. We're looking, tomorrow night's program um, is a Spanish town hall. We're repeating this information and making sure we're answering questions tomorrow night. Thursday's town hall is again, similar information presented specifically with, um, facilitators from our Asian American coalition um, that will lead to subsequent town halls in various languages. We do want to be sure though, that people that are not able to make it tonight are able to come to future ones. So there will be additional town halls. And yes, we will be repeating information and an answering questions again. Our intent is to make sure that people feel equipped to apply through the process. For projects that will be in effect over the course of several years, will the funding be distributed all at once or should proposal budgets include a timing aspect? Your proposal budget should include your plan for your project. So when you need funding to execute a project, the funding can be dispersed in almost any method that is allowed under the grant funds. It has to be obligated by the end of 2024. It has to be liquidated by the end of 2026. We in the recovery office are interested in making sure that we work with project submitters to ensure the projects are given the best chance of succeeding for the, with the financial resources that are at our disposal. Um, I, and again, this is a great question simply because our priorities as Ms. Hertz and um, Ms. O'Malley stated are meant to be inclusive and as general as possible. We also don't want to be so specific that we're listing every possible one because they are purposely general. So there's a question here that I don't see food insecurity among the community priorities. Absolutely, food insecurity is 
again, when we think about this, and this is a good exercise as far as thinking about what types of projects are looked at favorably. Great projects will touch multiple ARPA eligibility rules while fulfilling multiple county priorities, food security, food insecurity, and, and programs to increase systemic distribution networks and get to the, you know, our work is meant to be transformative. And so the systems changes, the getting to the source of the fire and not the flames, all of those are good projects, whether they have to do with food security or any of the other many issues, absolutely, that's certainly a priority we would consider. One organization can absolutely submit multiple ideas or projects. Our portal allows you to create a profile and submit multiple ideas or projects after you've created that profile. There's a question here, can you directly address whether public park and recreation project would be considered an eligible project type? Absolutely, we were speaking about this today. If they are framed in a way that is in line with what the pandemic recovery fund priorities are, and they are judged to be eligible. I say that because during the pandemic, as we all know, parks and recreation was actually one of the few resources that was made to be open and provided a respite for many people. Those type of projects represent, could represent fulfillment of multiple categories, whether it's essential workers, whether it's economic recovery for hearted areas, community development, underserved community, like all of those things are part of a parks project, community center project. This is precisely in line with the priorities and the eligibility rules that are here. I think, oh, sorry, there's one project again. And I do wanna just spend a second here. There's a question here, will leadership projects for at-risk youth be funded? My answer to that question is tonight and never will I ever say this project will be funded, all right? Projects for at-risk use, all projects through this process will be considered and scored. And we are looking to help you submit it through our technical assistance providers. We're looking to ensure that you understand what our priorities are, what the instructions to submit are. So while I certainly couldn't say, and I think you would understand that, that some project would be funded and another one wouldn't be, that type of project is certainly in line with the priorities and the parameters that were established both in the funding and, and in the county's priorities. So, I, sorry, Kelly, should I go through and I can promote people that are, are you, okay. Sure, well, why don't, I mean, I, we can take a break and then we can. Okay, um, we have a couple people with their hand up. So I just wanted to make sure that we unmuted the folks that would like to talk. Um, first, we have Aaron Riley. You can unmute to ask your question. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. This is Erin Riley at the Riverbend Environmental Education Center. Thank you so much for tonight's session. Um, I was wondering about follow up on a conversation that we had on one of these webinars back in January where the recovery office was talking about a hope to, during the period of time that the grant portal is open, provide a kind of matchmaking function. Um, so for those who have ideas that might inform those who have projects that are open to ideas. So for instance, Riverbend is working on a project that would put thousands of children outside in nature for summertime via nature summer camps. And that's a project where I am enthusiastically welcoming input. The project is going to be improved and enhanced if I can get, um, if I can quickly get connected with um, a wider swath of community organizations that might, whose goals might also be met by this project. And so I'm just wondering, once someone submits a project, if then new information comes in that would enhance and improve the project, I guess is, first of all, is the county still playing that matchmaking role? And secondly, is there an opportunity to go back and um, revise the submitted project within the February 28th to April 30th time window? Um, you know, because hopefully the, as the weeks go on, your project gets better and enriched by communication with other community members. Um, so that's my question. 
appreciate that question, Ms. Riley. Um, I'm fortunate tonight to have Ms. O'Malley and Ms. Hertz who are both directly involved in this incubation effort. So I'm gonna actually turn it over to Barbara to answer it first. And obviously Emma is also on the Sure, so first I wanna reiterate what Tom did say about you shouldn't feel like you're in a rush to submit any projects or ideas. Feel free to take your time to develop partnerships, think through things. But obviously once you do submit an idea, there's two opportunities I think that would assist a, a situation like yours. One is that if an idea or project comes in, we will be looking at them, putting them through the objective scoring, but particularly with the ideas, we are gonna review them on a routine process to say, are these projects ideas that other people are thinking of? Could we potentially put people together to support and make a stronger individual project? So we wanna be very effective and efficient with this funding. If there's partners and things that we see that could enhance one another, we will absolutely work to put them in touch with each other. So that would be one way through the submission process that happens. In addition, we are also working with some community partners and do hope to have um, some dates to announce soon nothing has been finalized yet, but to have what we're calling incubation meetings, which will actually be topic specific meetings where people can talk about and develop the partnerships that you're speaking of and hopefully walk away with um, partners that are interested in the same things or ideas and how to develop them a little more fully and support one another. And again, have more su successful and stronger application processes. So as those get developed, we will absolutely announce those, put them out on our website, social media, and a variety of ways, but we absolutely want to make sure that these um, opportunities are as broad as possible and as strong as possible. Thank you, Ms. O'Malley and Ms. Riley. Okay. Yeah. Um, next, and again, I apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name. Um, Jason Lanier, you can unmute to ask your question. Hi, uh, Jason Lanier, Lansdale Borough. Um, I was calling in, uh, I was listening to this discussion in the beginning, talking about all of this grant funding. Just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of where grant funding comes from. It doesn't come from the federal government. It comes from the taxpayer. And all of this money that eventually, uh, that we're, all this money that we're spending or going to be spending is going to come back for all of us taxpayers to pay. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's direct payment of taxes or through inflation, which we've already seen a high, uh, high rate of inflation currently. I don't know if you guys keep on top of the um, consumer price index, uh, that's inflation or the PPI, which is uh, producer price index, was up 9.4% last month. 9.4%, which means that coming forward, tax or inflation is for us, buying things is gonna increase to double digits. No doubt, this is not this is not arguable. So I, my thought is to take some of this this funding and make tax relief for all of us who are paying out the nose currently for products, who will be paying for more in the future, who are increasing our our state and federal taxes. We are going to have to pay more, and just throwing money uh, out to create any project isn't very beneficial if the people who are going to take advantage can't afford, can't afford to live in Montgomery County. Uh, County. And uh, as a question, I was wondering, is there any requirement to maintain on a constant basis? I know the Escher funding uh, for schools is, is contracted such that kids are required to wear a mask constantly, regardless of how beneficial it is to them, um, or you know, even how detrimental uh, the Omicron virus is to them, they're still required to wear a mask. And we're seeing developmental delays, lots of problems with kids in school, not wanting to be in school, not liking the school. And that seems like a high cost to me for, for grant funding from, from the federal government to the state, to the state, to the school districts. So I, I'm, I'm hoping there's some consideration of, of where this money is really coming from and how this is going to be detrimental to the taxpayer's pocket in order to create a, whatever it's gonna do uh, for a community that which they're gonna have a hard time living in. It's a, it's a big picture thing. Uh, you guys need to look at it. And, and as a quick summary, <laughs> as a quick summary, I guess it was uh, uh, Barbara O'Malley said something about Big Back Better. I, I don't know if you guys are aware of what that, that, that uh, uh, expression comes from or that, that um, alliteration comes from. It comes from the World Economic Forum. The idea is for uh, a mass 
expenditure of monies by all the countries participating in order to make things more equitable by pulling everybody down. Anybody interested, look it up. I'm not lying, they'll tell you. Their, their plan is to have, uh, you will own nothing by 2030. So maybe take a look at that. You can call it a conspiracy. They say they wanna do it. And we have a lot of people in our current government and governments around the world that are buying on, into it, hook, line, and sinker. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Um, we will now go to John Spiegelman. You can unmute yourself to ask your question. Hi, thanks so much. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Great, thanks very much. Um, I put this question in, um, uh, in the Q and A, but I haven't seen the answer for it yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm a, a township commissioner in Abington Township, and um, we're uh, working on putting together a, a project proposal, um, wherein we would partner our ARPA funds, because we of course got our own municipal ARPA funding, um, uh, with some from the county, possibly some from uh, a few of our neighboring municipalities, um, in order to uh, in order to partner with Aqua and pay for the filtration of uh, PFOS out of a, uh, a, a well that is physically located in Abington, but actually serves multiple municipalities. And one of the areas it serves is a uh, um, is a is, is actually one of the uh, oldest, um, certainly in, in um, Abington Township, and I think um, I think uh, in throughout Montgomery County, uh, one of the, the oldest and longest established um, communities of color, African American communities um, here uh, here in our township and in this whole part of uh, southeastern Monco. Um, and uh, the I was wondering. Um, so we're actually very excited to to put this proposal together and submit it. But I was wondering because the proposal would involve a combination of our municipal ARPA funding and and uh, and county funding and maybe maybe so, some from other municipalities as well. Would that follow the same procedure, or is there like a, a, a different portal for that because it's a somewhat of an unusual configuration? No, I appreciate your question, uh, Councilman uh, Spiegelman. The answer to your question is all of the county's funding will go through this process, right? So, to your point, it is a complex project. It is a you know, you know, you, you've spent a lot of good time planning it out. We would be interested in, you know receiving this as a project submission, right? And so all of our funding will go through the project process that we've outlined tonight and that you'll see on our website. At the same time, and we will, we are having partnership meetings with our municipalities and school districts just to understand the relationship between the funding that is received at the municipal level and, the, and any sort of, as I mentioned earlier, augmented or supplemented funding for certain projects. If we are found to benefit that it would still be submitted again through this process in the transparent way that would be broadcast. So there's not, I would say a different track. That said, the coordination of the logistics and what the project management structure would look like and all of that, that is something that, you know, as far as partnering across jurisdictions, we would certainly, you know, be interested in doing. And so I do wanna be clear though, that there isn't a different tack. All projects, any project that we fund has to come through this process. Got it. Same portal. Uh, understood. Um, thank you very much. As I said, really looking forward to uh, to submitting this and hopefully um, uh, working together uh, with the great folks of the county. Um, thanks for putting this information session together, and I uh, definitely look forward to to downloading the spreadsheet and, and checking out the uh, the portal on the web. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. I just you want me to do a couple of the short if you want to do some sure. Just there's a couple quick questions in the chat in the Q and A. Um, can land acquisition for affordable housing construction be considered? Should each construction proposal per, include proof of site control? Um, I'm going to address the first question. I mean, so certainly the answer to that question is yes, but I want to use it to expand in that. Ms. Hertz and myself both mentioned the one-time nature of this funding. The best projects that will happen here comply with that strictly in that we are looking to inject transformative changes, new facilities, new land, new programs, new systems, one time. And so this, my point in answering this question is that the acquisition of land isn't exactly in line with that intent, right? You are changing the way you're able to do business after the fact. You are not creating an operating mandate, meaning that you do not have to 
necessarily, you're not creating a funding mandate that needs to continue far beyond the ARPA funding. And ostensibly, the submission for this project would have um, a plan to deal with how to operate the site after that. Um, the second piece of this question around, um, sorry, I actually just disappeared on me, sorry, um, was proof of site control. Again, construction projects, we are interested in considering your projects as they are today. We, you should have thought them through. We are looking for comprehensive budgets and project plans and justifications. But at the same time, whatever status you're in, so if the next step is we need to acquire the site and then the step after that is to plan for construction, just to use this project example, that's certainly a project that would be considered. Um, I just wanna, uh, there is a clarification. If you feel the project needs multiple groups to come together to complete it, those groups should work together to submit one project proposal, correct? That is correct. Um, if it is one project that multiple groups will be working on together, yes, they should submit it as one project. Um, there's a question on here about um, a max or minimum per project budget. Um, the county is seeking to be both efficient and transformative with these with this funding. And so while there isn't necessarily a maximum or a minimum on the project, we are looking to ensure that we have the capability to fulfill that mandate that we have, which is to make sure that we work transformatively and equitably across the county in a, in a, in a way that benefits as many people as possible. So, excuse me, I'm sorry. So I think we can. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry about that. Okay, we have two other people with their hand raised, so um, we will go to Michael Selick. You can now unmute to ask your question. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Michael Selick. I uh, work in the borough of Hatboro at the historic <laughs> public library there. I appreciate you all putting this uh, together and hearing us out. Uh, I have Grew up in Roslyn and Abington, so I've been a library user in the county most of my life, and uh, I love library. I happen to work in, in one as well. Um, we have a great series of libraries in the county, and I just wanted to say I would love to see a consideration of some funding toward libraries. We were uh, one of the key uh, groups, not first responders exactly, but one of the key uh, organizations that uh, responded to the pandemic, and we had a uh, like everybody else had to work twists and turns to continue to serve our population, but um, we managed to do that and uh, we have many great things we'd love to have funded and uh, request consideration for that moving forward. Thank you. Michael, I appreciate that. And I do want to be sure that, I, I mean, libraries and community centers and the crossover between them is explicitly mentioned several, you know, throughout the guidance around this funding. And so honestly, and this is this is representative, I do wanna be clear, and, and this is not to put you on the spot, but to use this as an example, we need to get that project from you. Even if you submit it as an idea, this is, a, this is a need in the community, I can recognize that. We don't know everything about every project that needs to be done in Montgomery County until we are told. And the reason we have built this process in a way that allows people to submit both ideas and full on project proposals for funding is because we want to hear from you. And so what you just outlined as far as investments in libraries and community centers is, as I said, explicitly identified in the grant guidance and it would certainly be considered, but we can't consider it until it's submitted. And as I said, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I'm using you as an example because we would love to have this type of project submitted. Let me put it that. Yes, of course, I understood that. And, and uh, I'm sure uh, the, the other library directors in the county and I will be uh, busy at work on that first thing in the morning tomorrow. Thank Absolutely. You. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you can do it to Monday if you want. It doesn't open until Monday, but I appreciate that. Okay. Um, next, we have John uh, Weidman. If you want to unmute to ask your question. Yep. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, I just want to thank the department for uh, securing these critical funds. Um, I'm a strong supporter in Build Back Better and um, uh, you know, I, I think this is um, really exciting. And so thanks for all your hard work. My question was in the 
Q and A just about the five ARPA eligibility criteria. Oh, sure. Does a project need to hit every one of those, or if you're in one or a couple, then you're eligible? Um, so, Mr. Weidman, I do uh, apologize. I missed your. I saw. I see it now, actually. And um, the answer to your question is no. You do not need to hit every single one of them. We make a comment in the presentation, and and it is true that. Great projects hit many of them, but good pro I mean, there's no requirement that you have to hit more than one. We have to be sure that the project is eligible for the expense. So any one of those is eligible and multiple different types of projects within them is certainly eligible. So, I mean, I can leave it there where no, you yep. do not have to hit more than one. We are seek those type of transformative projects help hit county priorities while also falling into multiple uh, categories on the eligibility criteria. Thanks very much. Certainly. Okay. Um, next, we have Gigi Tevlin Moffitt. Hi. Thanks so much for having this. Sorry, Gigi, can you unmute again? Lots of people would love to mute me. <laughs> <laughs> the line is long. Um, I'm here in Norbert Borough. Um, so one of the projects that we're considering here from the Narva the Community Food Bank, the organization that I run, um, I guess my question is this. So out of the ordinary, any projects, and I know Tom, you said this again uh, before, but um, ordinarily, you know, when you hear Narva, you automatically say Lower Marion, but there are communities that are um, experiencing the same situations and challenges that Narva does. The partnering of communities, when we write one of the ideas that we have, and I'm sorry, it's not specific, but one piece would fit in Norbert, but they are connected pieces to build into another community or vice versa. So my, and Barb knows this, she's heard it a thousand times, repeatable models of um, success. So, and that's really what we're interested in doing is creating a model that could be repeated or could be connected to other communities across the county. Obviously not a mirror one for one match because each community is unique, but, um, would we be knocked out if we were not saying it's 100%, this whole piece is for Narberth and not a whole piece for Pottstown, uh, but it would be a build-in process at the next location or vice versa. Did I make that clear? Sure, oh, I think so. And um, I think the first, the easy answer is no, you certainly would not be quote knocked out. I mean, I think we would be, and part of the work that our team in, in the recovery office is doing is to be sure that we are connecting dots that you are already connecting them, but sometimes we may get related projects that are in different places that actually would make sense to try to do together. And so our work is to try to make those connections as we see the submissions come in. If you do it in advance, it's certainly not something where we would say, oh no, that's too many all at the same time. I mentioned earlier, and I, I certainly would stand by this, um, the couple of township commissioners that have submitted questions, I think we are interested in making sure that we are coordinating these resources as makes the most sense for all of us. And so to the extent that you have a project that, you know, just to use your example, that Pottstown was also doing, or that maybe someone in Chester County was doing, like those projects are all still good just because they're outside the, you know, quote unquote boundaries of Montgomery County. Um, I'm not, I hope that answers your question, but I, I did want to... <laughs> First of all, say that of course you wouldn't be quote knocked out for. It does. Something. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Okay. Um, we just have what's remaining in the Q and A. Sure. So um, everybody that had their hand raised has been. And I did. I apologize. I wasn't reading the names here. Um, so there's a question here from Michelle Barrett. Would workforce development programs for neurodivergent autistic people of color women qualify? I think. I mean. Based on this question, certainly that would be something that we would consider in line with the priorities and the and the and the eligibility criteria. I would say, and this is again just to stress this aspect of this funding, as one-time funding, we are interested in making sure we're investing in whether they're social programs, health programs, behavior health. We are investing in those type of programs. What has to happen though is that when the projects come through, it's clear that the investment that's made with this funding, you understand and we understand it will end at the end of 2026. And so if there is a 
program that is built, there has to be a sustainability plan submitted with the project for us to consider it a, an, an investment here. And so the successful projects will reflect understanding of that aspect of this being one-time funding. Um, um, will pre-existing programs be considering for funding? I mean, I think in a vacuum, I would say the answer to that question is sure. Um, <laughs> it's hard to know when you say pre-existing, I mean, uh, there isn't a prohibition on something that's been funded. However, again, going back to this one time transformative nature, if this is something where it's a steady state program that is funded and is doing everything it possibly could be under, that would be a difficult one. If it could be expanded, if there's new aspects to it, certainly this is an appropriate use of these funds. And then Peggy Lee Clark, has there been any discussion that although it's nice to spread the money around, uh, projects that are underfunded are often unable to be executed. I think, and again, this is another opportunity question for, for me to expand on this. I think that aspect of what projects have been historically, good ideas have not gotten funded. And frankly, that is one of the opportunities we have from this funding program. What is implied in this question is that certainly if there are programs that have not been made the cut, so for instance, whether it's, you know, county or municipal budgeting or state budgeting, um, we are certainly interested in considering those. And so that is, if there are those opportunities out there that haven't been pursued for a variety of reasons on a legacy basis, on a, on a, on a directed basis, I think that is something that certainly can falls under this category of transformative, changing the way we do systems and um, business in general, changing the way we do that. Okay. Just okay. I did want to just give anybody in the room an opportunity. I know there's so a few people here. Um, if you want to say anything, you're more than welcome. Yeah. Uh, sure. Come on up. Um, keep the mask on for you guys. Uh, my name is Dominic Jafrida. I've uh, lived in Norristown my whole life. Um, I specialize in uh, renewable infrastructure planning, uh, as well as other uh, philanthrop philanthropic uh, entrepreneurial ideas. Um, I help to like sponsor those or uh, work towards uh, providing a realistic idea of what you, someone could do with something that's just an idea and turning it into a reality. Uh, my specialty though is in renewable infrastructure planning. Um, and I work with a few a nonprofit, actually a few nonprofit organizations in this area. We were going over the funding opportunity. And one question that came from Norristown Safe House is uh, that's a homeless shelter that I help run here in Norristown. Um, we wanna get involved with the uh, water uh, management issue as well, uh, infrastructure planning and energy issue. One of the uh, questions we had is, are you guys gonna be funding things like vehicle purchases, um, real estate purchases, things like that, as long as the uh, sustainability end of that is, is followed through with on our end? Thank you. Well, that, that's an interesting question. I will say that this particular issue of like what, when you get down to the nitty gritty of what the details, this is all will be available on our website in the guidance. But I will say from the perspective of, I don't know if they're connected, but you mentioned clean water infrastructure, right? So if there's a clean water infrastructure project that you are contemplating, what does it take to do the project? It takes contractors or I'm making this up, but it may take vehicles, it may take whatever. If it's funded as a project, you can submit it as a project that includes, this is what I need to do this project, right? If it is something where it helped, so that's one option. There's something where it says, I want, I need to build capacity for my organization. Um, here's the work we do. That is also a project. I will say that's a different type of project, but and that's where we get into what is eligible on a one-time basis for, meaning I want this truck, right? Or whatever it is. Um, if the truck is purchased in the way to equip in the rest of a project and there's, con there's all kinds of stuff involved, that's a different sort of level of consideration. So I hear myself not all the way answering your question, but that's simply because like the explicit prohibitions and, and allowances that are in the guidance would, would employ, would 
would apply here, meaning that we would have to make sure that what's, so I would encourage you when we post all this information, use the technical assistance provider, look at our website. We have the information that will say what's eligible and what isn't as far as capital expenditures, that kind of thing. Sure. Um, yes. So we have a great team in the recovery office. I will say this is directly what the technical assistance provider is contracted to do, right? So like that type of assistance with how does this proposal look? Is this in line with what the guidance is, that kind of thing. So, and that, I say that one most readily and easiest because it is explicitly why we are contracting for that service. And so the contact information for that firm is will be posted on the website for you to utilize. Thanks. So much. All right. Great. I don't, I didn't see anything else come through. Oh. Um, sure. So, I can actually answer these last few live. The, if we are still from Rebecca Schulman, I can't see the end of the last name. Um, if we are still developing a project, will there be funding later on? If we submit an idea, would it be best to pull the project together in time to submit for this deadline? Um, this is a tough question to answer. I think, let me focus on the aspect of your question that says, will there be funding later on if we submit an idea? And so the answer to that question is the county is committed to following this process for the full expenditure of the 161.4 million. That said, depending on the responses that we get, we, and I say we, but county management may elect to reserve a certain a chunk, a small chunk a big, of funding for a future funding round that would follow this exact same process. I, my, I suppose my advice would be if you're submitting an idea, that's certainly a great start, um, if you're able to pull something together in the next two months or so, then that, that would also work. Um, I, I say that this aspect of we could be funding something, but there's no guarantee of that happening. So if we get great projects, which we hope we, hopefully we do, we want to be sure we allow everyone the time to do the best projects, the highest, best use of this funding. That means we're already three and a half years from the end. And so we wanna be sure that we allow people time. What that may mean is that we seek to award all of the funding in this first round right away. And so I suppose I don't have great advice for you either way, but I said at least submit the idea and then we can work through um, what would happen. Um, could these awards be used in conjunction with another, another governmental entity, for example, PHFA and HUD? Uh, the answer to that question is it could. We ask these questions in our application process as far as if there's other funding that's been applied. Um, but it's not, it's not a quote deal breaker where we would say, oh, they're already getting funding from another source. Um, we recognize that good projects sometimes have funding at a certain level. And if you had more, you'd be able to do more. At the same time, some projects are maxed out and, and the funding is there. Again, the highest best use of the funding that we have is what we're seeking to make sure that we execute. And so um, there's no hard yes or no about, certain, the answer to your question is actually yes. Could these awards be used? Sure. Uh, we would make sure to consider what else is out there. On the ideal budget size, I think it's better to think about the best projects that we have are ones that we will get, we believe, will be. You are addressing many of the county priorities. You are addressing as many of the ARPA, of the uh, state and local fiscal recovery fund legislation priorities, all in the same project. You are also affecting as many people as possible and you are efficiently spending funds. That could mean you're asking for $20 million. It could mean you're asking for $250,000. So truthfully, I do not have an ideal budget size. What we are looking, the ideal project is one that efficiently uses the resources to effectuate change in the greatest manner possible. Colleges and universities are certainly eligible to submit funding requests um, as non, most of them are nonprofit institutions. Um, you are, we would welcome submissions from partners across the county and, and elsewhere for in the college and university category. Absolutely. All right.
thanks very much, everyone. Um, I will close this out. Uh, appreciate everyone being here tonight. As please pay attention to our website, we will have additional town halls and information posted there. As I said, the application process opens on Monday. Uh, we look forward to receiving your very good ideas. Thanks very much. <laughs>